art for the animated episode Dreamland and also the abandoned animated series. By the design of the likeness of the villains, heroes, environments, and ships in the adventure games. Yeah, I, I think the, the the likeness was really good, considering the budget that they had for the adventure games, because they, they weren't they weren't big retail. You know, they didn't appear in retail stores, so they didn't have the biggest budgets. So considering that, yeah, I think they did really really well. I I specifically like the. Uh, Giant sharks that they modelled in um, along with the Bastion Rada. Uh, which concept art design from the series? So either so from 2005 up to the present series, have uh, you been impressed with the most and why? That's got to be the the Silurian um, for the 2010 season. There were some really nice uh, concept arts of the face that referred back to the, the 1970s John Pertwee Silurian, but it didn't get used. So I was a bit disappointed, but still the best concept art. 
Um, in your opinion, uh, which would you say was the more challenging to convert from concept art design to screen? Definitely the absorber lock. Because it, it looked interesting from the design, obviously it came from Will Grantham on Blue Peter, so it was a child's design and it looked brilliant, but I just don't think they pulled it off, I don't think it looked that good on screen in the episode, so I guess that probably was a challenge for them. Okay. Or, I don't know, they just got lazy. <laughs> um, and finally, um, in terms of overall concept, concept design on the show itself. Um, I would feel the level of it has, has been from its relaunch to now. Um, I think it's probably, I'd say it's worse now because I don't actually see a lot of it. They don't release a lot, but back in 2005 you could get books, you could get lots of books with those concept art. So I can't really comment because I've seen a lot.
make it look cool style. Like, we all remember that the Doctor Who original stuff was quite, uh, <laughs> you, you couldn't say badly put together, but it certainly wasn't up to Star Wars standard. And then the, the new stuff, they tried to push that a bit further, but they didn't quite take it to, like, it wasn't like Blade Runner or Star Wars. So it's getting that balance right so that the concept felt like it belonged to Doctor Who rather than belonging to Halo or Blade Runner or something like that. That was that was a bit of a challenge because as a concept artist you can often you can try to push too far and too far with things um, and it end up feeling not not quite living in the Doctor Who world. But that that was just a matter of playing where, uh, watching through all the episodes and trying to get a feel for for what what it is that makes a Doctor Who the, the BBC part. did give us access as well to a lot of their concept artwork from the show, um, so we did see what they were working on early. Uh, we had access to all the actors, so we went on photo shoots with the actors to, to take photos of faces, for textures, for expressions. Uh, uh, we saw, uh, we had early access to um, the costumes, um, so we could, we could create the models early. Uh, and even the new TARDIS was, um, we had. Uh, input is the wrong word. We we had early sight of the TARDIS and and um, and were certainly allowed to add to that concept for, for certain other ep uh, episodes that, that we did. Um, but it, it was a close collaboration as well. Um, the BBC didn't just leave us out on a limb and say, "There you go, you do that and, and um, see what you come up with." It was very much come down to the studio, see a, a, a show being made. Um, work with the actors. Uh, our, our creative director even sat in on one of the readings for the, the original series. Uh, so it was really close collaboration. Um, well, in terms of you mentioning about the TARDIS itself, um, it means you have like a small side of it. Um, in terms of challenging of designing that TARDIS interior for the third game in the series, I want to call the TARDIS, um, I suppose, in terms of challenges, challenges uh, how much of one was it for like design, like the extended, extended rooms? Um, well, when we went down to the BBC to see the sets, um, we saw the original TARDIS, the, the David Tennant TARDIS mm. uh, set. That was that was still there, and the new set was being built. Um, and originally when we saw it, there were some ideas that they were using in that that, that never actually made it to the TV show. So, mm -hmm. so we, we kind of had to, to work with them as, as things changed along the way. They, they by, by, by input uh, earlier, I, I meant um, they knew we were making a series that did have extra rooms in the TARDIS. So, so they did put uh, a doorway in the TARDIS, in the TV show, that the Doctor never uses, but it's there. Um, and that was kind of for us, mm. um, to, to just say, you know, the TARDIS is bigger. All, all the fans know the TARDIS is bigger than it is, and there's, there's lots of other rooms. Um, but it, it was free reign. We, we knew the style of the, of the, the main room, um, and they, they just let us go nuts with, with kind of what we thought the rest of it would look like. Um, they gave us feedback along the way. Um, and then signed it off uh, when they thought we'd kind of nailed it. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, the environments, the concept side of it, um, was it much of a challenge or was it fairly straightforward for designing environments like Scaro or ships like Cybership, 17th century London? Um, so if we start with Scaro, mm. I don't think that had ever been shown before properly. Yeah. So that that was quite a challenge. Um, I think there was some some really limited amount of concept work that I'd seen for what Scarrow might look like. So I did spend a lot of time trying to figure out the shape language, trying to figure out what colours this world would be, and just get as much information from uh, the creative leads and at BBC as possible about what happens on this planet, how it's put together. That was the biggest challenge. Um, designing the Cybermen ship was less of a one because it was simply taking the, the Cybermen's shape design and colours and just trying to apply that to a ship. So it was challenging but it, it certainly wasn't in the same like, realm of difficulty as doing Scarrow. That was quite a challenge. Um, 
and that there, there were some other environments that were, again, slightly easier because they were set on our planet and they were a lot easier to do. Yeah. The, the, the scar, is it called Scarrow? Yeah. yeah so, that was the challenge. Yeah. So that was the main difficulty. Yeah. Um, um, what was the most diff what was the most difficult aspect of the games as a whole, not just one in particular, but as a whole franchise? Um, well, from my point of view, um, I think getting the games to sit in the Doctor Who world mm. uh, was was the challenge. That they needed to feel like Doctor Who. Uh, they had to work for people from eight to eighty as well, not 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 like normal games where they're targeted at a very specific audience, they have to be targeted at the same people that watch a TV show. Um, obviously having the characters in there, having the voiceover from the real characters, uh, Matt Smith especially, made, made it feel very, very Doctor Who. But getting the right types of puzzles and getting the right sort of suspense in there that, that, that would work for all ages. Um, and balancing the game in terms of difficulty um, was, was probably the, the biggest challenge for us. Um, last question. Um, what part of the franchise do you both feel stood out in terms of design? Um, I think my favourite one was the um, was the Cybermen one. Uh, the, the way it was set in the ice and, and in a deserted um, uh, kind of outpost in the Arctic. Um, that I, I think that had very, very strong design, um, and obviously the, the, the Cybermen uh, side of it I think worked particularly well, they're, they're a great character for creating in 3D anyway, um, but I, I, I felt we did particularly well on that one. And okay. um, what was yours, Richard? Well, I personally enjoyed working on the Dalek stuff, uh, it, because so little had been done on it in the past, there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of creativity involved in trying to figure out what what the whole world would look like, and that for me was really interesting. Um, but I think I agree with Darren that the most successful one was the, the Cybermen one. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. Darren, Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Sorry, sorry. 
I'm going backwards on myself. Never got an idea. Um, the environment, the aliens, and the devices, weapons, seen in the episode. <clears throat> what was the easiest environment to conceptually design? Answer. They only really did rough designs for a few of the environments, but the easiest of which was probably the observation room in the military base. What was the easiest alien to conceptually design? The Greys. It was really just a question of reinventing an existing design to fit the animation. What was the most difficult slash challenging environment to conceptually design? Again, they mainly presented the animators with rough sketches for the environments just to get an idea so it would have been the environment artists that had the challenge B. what was the most difficult challenging alien to, to design the vibe prox as the animation was targeted at a younger audience the creature designs had to reflect that as in not terrifying the vibe prox was the first to be designed so once we got that working the rest fell into place. Finally, was it difficult doing the concept design for the TARDIS interior knowing it would be 3D animated? No, it was done entirely in-house. They had no part of it. As I remember, the BBC gave the studio extensive reference for this. Digitally, better art, it will continue to evolve. That is the end, so I hope you've enjoyed it. I have. And it seems not a moment too soon.